ones that are large? Yes. Okay. I'm just beyond that now. So now what I'd like you to see, so I want to hear, and for your enjoyment, <laughs> we can explain the uh, tonight's program and how it'll kind of begin and, and be involved. We're going to start off with a song, an opera, a piece that we discovered very recently uh, by Prince Vile. Um, it's an anti-fascist piece. <laughs> Please watch your step. That's all right. We will. Thank you. Uh, sorry about that. D, don't have a nervous breakdown wherever you are. Okay, so um, D's work just fell off. Uh, anyway, it's an anti-fascist um, piece, and it's called White Cheese, and it is about um, a young girl who is blind, but she's the only one that can actually see that fascism is coming. And, uh, and it's dedicated to uh, all of us to try and learn how to see, obviously, with something other than our eyes, since that's clearly not working. The people that are uh, going to be involved with the, the chorus is going gonna, gonna to be seen as a chorus. The first time, they're going to sing it in uh, English, the second time in German, and the third time in Chinese. And uh, this is to reach out to the world. Now, um, the people that are on keyboards is, where is Dave? Is Dave Johnson. Um, Dave is a PhD student. Uh, and he is 100% um, blind and wanted everybody to know this in case you didn't know this. Uh, and also he has an art piece outside which are sculptures and you are to put on gloves to touch it since that's what people have to do when they're blind if they go to an art gallery. They can't touch anything without gloves. So there are sculptures, put your gloves on, you'll see them. Uh, and then we have uh, the voice is Julia Wolf. <laughs> and then we have flute is Lauren good? Yay, everybody. And where is our cellist? I'm not where is Chang? I'm not sure where she's Chang. here, but she's, I'm not sure. Chang is coming. This is Chang <laughs> and her cello. I don't know what's happened to her. She'll be here soon. Yay, Chang. OK, um, right. Now, you'll see that uh, they'll begin, and then there's a whole set of things to do. Uh, we start with Sarah Diamond, who has a think piece on uh, um, challenging um, Artificial Intelligence with Contemporary Decolonization Discourse, and then Cole Self, which we'll, she, we will just run into these things. She will start with a ritual, Shannon Forrester's uh, spoken word, uh, uh, Larry is speaking on uh, the Relic Traveler, phase one, um, Mariana is doing a storytelling, and then Gerald Nessler is making the black box speak, and then we break. And then we go downstairs to, and there's drinks, by the way, which are on the house. Uh, and then we go downstairs to see a drone um, performance uh, with uh, Anna Nazo, uh, which is in the Gorvey, um, the Gorvey uh, Gallery, uh, the, Gorvey, the Dyson Gallery. And then we have um, uh, a little interval uh, to please make your way back upstairs. And then we have Despina, who's going to be doing uh, a work that has uh, nudity and s violence, and so if, if in any way that offends you, don't come in. Okay, so that's just, I'm just giving you a warning about that. Um, and uh, it's a disclaimer, otherwise come in. And then um, we have our second chorus, which is um, the German version of uh, Kurt Weil's piece. And then we have, if you turn the page over, we have Adam doing uh, sort of a spoken word, our skins are porous too. Despina Papadopoulos has a, a one minute and 37 second video. And Jack Jels is doing something from CERN. He's part of the uh, CERN um, artistic duo of uh, Hartoon Mirza and uh, Jack Jels. And then Mano Lush's film Algorithm will come on. Dario uh, Srivik, whose name I've always massacred. Sorry about that, Dario. Um, I was B1, and I have not, 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 and you'll see what this is about. Um, and then Aura Sats, ha Sats has a, um, a piece called Entangled Night Visions. Then we have the last chorus, which is the Chinese version. And then um, you can be wandering around, and hopefully we get this all in between now and nine, is the idea. Okay? <coughs> and it's all being recorded. It's live streamed. Uh, you'll see um, little things sticking around, like a mannequin from Orla. Um, and there's eggs here that you can touch um, at some point from Diego. And there's w uh, work outside that you'll also see. That's all listed on here. I don't want to go through it any longer. Emma, what would you like to say? So I just want to remind you that opera it, it means work of art, but also we're thinking about opera in terms of 
Brecht and Weil. So that means that the audience is as implicated as the performers. And also this is the result of the brilliant um, engagement of all of the participants in Entanglement, the group. And of course, uh, we need to thank Johnny for setting all of that up and for all of this. Thank you, Johnny. Also, Anne Defoe and Scott Blackburn, who's upstairs. Thank you. And all the technicians. Thank you. Let's, have, let's rock and roll here. Let's do it.
Thank you, um, and a huge, huge pleasure to be here. Um, Indigenous scholars, knowledge bearers, and communities offer reflexive, place-based, and relational methods that can add a significant dimension to transdisciplinary research, including that of art and humanities scholars with core values of responsibility, future impact, and temporality. While they are distinct from one another, many Indigenous communities espouse a holistic and integrated view of science, technology, and culture, with cultural expressions operating as a means to observe, uncover, and express scientific discovery. In considering AI, it is valuable to acknowledge that non-human agency has deep cultural roots outside of the Western imaginary. I see my work as an ally who can support this dialogue in partnership with Indigenous peoples. The Canadian Royal Commission on Aboriginal People, published in 1996, addressed systemic violence against Indigenous bodies and attacks against constitutionally protected Aboriginal status. Recently, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission catalogued the disaster of 100 years of forced residential schools and called for conciliation. Also important is the growing acknowledgement by settler Canadians that we work, live, and create on treaty land or unceded territories, which means that all relationships should follow nation-to-nation -nation protocol and treaty conditions. For example, Toronto's dish with one spoon agreement with the Mississauga of the credit requires reciprocal gifts between people and leaving the land intact. The TRC called for the decolonization of discourse and practices within institutions, whether those of science or the arts. Canada is not alone in facing the challenge of decolonization. James Charlton and the disabilities rights movement were the first to formulate the concept of nothing about us without us or by extension, everything about us with us. Many groups that perceive themselves to be on the margins of society, yet are the object of research and policy, have endorsed this premise. Margaret Elizabeth Kovac, who is Nihawaya in Salto, argues for the adoption of indigenous methods and the simultaneous decolonization of the academy so that researchers will not appropriate or misuse methods as they grow in application. Challenges to previous hierarchies will address the profoundly destructive impacts of centuries of genocidal policies and practices. Um, Andreas Kaplan and Michael Heinen define a Heinlein, excuse me, AI as a quote, system's ability to correctly interpret external data, to learn from such data, and to use those learnings to achieve specific goals and tasks through flexible adaption, unquote. They classify artificial intelligence into three types of systems analytic, human-inspired, and humanized artificial intelligence. Clemens Aprich notes that neural network models to describe and create intelligence have superseded the good old-fashioned artificial intelligence, i.e. GoFi, or GoFi, symbolic information processing model. And Oscar Schwartz further proposes that the future of AI and its historical antecedents in Turing versus Lick leader as automation, i.e. superhuman conscious anthropomorphic machines versus augmentation, human machine hybrid in which boundaries between the machine and the human are up for negotiation, I'll say so. What is at stake are decisions about the future of life and machines and pragmatic challenges in the practice of AI machine learning. Two immediate profound and related issues are the quality, security, and bias of data sets and related but not the same, the choice of data by designers and users and algorithmic bias. Clay Shirky is concerned that humans believe that algorithms hold more veracity than humans or algorithmic authority. That is, quote, the decision to regard as authoritative an unmanaged process of extracting value from diverse, untrustworthy, so untrustworthy sources, unquote, such as search results, fake news. Catherine Griffiths argues that we lack a theoretical framework to understand how and why algorithms make decisions. She sees the danger not as anthropomorphism, but rather stripping code of its human origins. Data sources are always a product of choice, human or agent, and programmers choice choose which data to use, then build hierarchies. And algorithms can provide outcomes biased to certainty when in fact there are multiple possibilities. And we can run through various um, issues, but these include pre-existing bias from engineers, 
technical bias, machines picking out certain traits through design, decontextualizing of algorithms, or the application of algorithms across new contexts without checking assumptions of previous use. In addition, training is an issue. Johannes Bruder points out that Google has trained DeepMind on video games and a series of mental disorders associated with cognitive functions such as the obsessive search for detail. There are other constructs of mind. So data-driven dis data discovery poses amplified threats to indigenous communities because of historical ways that the state, of the state and corporations have weaponized and used data for surveillance, control, and genocide. This is the case for the Inuit and Innu who were stripped of their traditional names and given a number or the numbering of treaties or the infamous in Indian card as a gateway to access or barriers to rights. For example, indigenous women who married outside their band lost all of their treaty rights. And until the late 1960s in Canada, if an indigenous Canadian attended college or university or hired a lawyer, they too lost their rights to land and to all of their other associated rights as an indigenous person. In the US, blood quantum remains a measurement of access to identity, status, and land. However, the opportunities and challenges of AI play out in the imperative of language preservation through natural language processing tools. 87% of indigenous languages are endangered in Canada, and uh, the residential school system relentlessly stripped these away from uh, indigenous Canadians. Recognizing that language is the repository of culture, the United Nations declared in 2019 that it was the year of indigenous languages and machine learning can store, analyze, and categorize language. However, as Bushra Abadi warns, while AI and other, and I quote, exponential technologies present opportunities for the preservation of language, there are also inherent challenges to using these technologies to meaningfully revitalize language. Many indigenous languages are rooted in oral tradition, and the act of transcribing them into a written form may alter or fail to capture the full meaning of language, unquote. Access and use of systems by indigenous communities is the other necessary side of preservation. The Australian Research Council's Center of Excellence for the Dynamics of Language has sourced over 40,000 hours of material and they have used Google's open source AI platform, TensorFlow, to analyze data. They've built models for six indigenous languages, Australian languages, and five Pacific Island languages. And the project now incorporates AI language recognition into their social robot, OPI, demonstrated here, designed to teach children to understand their own language. This is a very positive project. Nonetheless, engineers are unlikely to train Siri on Cree or Zulu, marginalizing indigenous language within mainstream homogenizing uses. Other uses of data by and AI by indigenous communities include sensor data to track game, fish stock and impacts from global warming, recognition of artifacts and their associations within the museum and gallery and private collectors in order to repatriate these, private collections, sorry, to repatriate these, self-managed health data collection and interventions such as for diabetes, and tracking migration, historical and oral documentation of land claims. So AI is growing in its value and interest to indigenous communities and researchers. In fact, rather than threat, indigenous imagination is fundamental to the conjuring and construction of other intelligences. That is, the act of forming a mental image of something that is, quote, uh, not present to the senses or never before wholly perceived in reality, unquote. Combining creative ability and resourcefulness. And according to Leanne Betsamoske Simpson, from the Anishinaabe perspective, the act of imagining through dreaming, whether lucid or in sleep, is fundamental to creativity. And she, say, she says, Gwetsi uh, Minidu dreamt our world into existence. She, he dreamed us into existence, demonstrating that the process of creation, visioning, making, doing, is the most powerful process in the universe, end of quote. Network theories are at the core of many indigenous philosophies. Viewing technology um, as part of natural systems and humans as relational actors. Margaret Kovac proposes that indigenous approaches to research differ from Western qualitative methodologies 
and that they rely on tribal knowledge and language that are fluid and consistently reflexive, positioning self into context. Place positions Indigenous people within their relationship to others, to the environment and to language. Sean Wilson, a Cree writer from Northern Manitoba, emphasizes relationality as a fundamental principle. And so these three principles, a shared aspect of the Indigenous ontology and epistemology is relationality. Relationships do not merely shape reality, they are reality too. The shared aspect of an Indigenous axiology and methodology is accountability to relationships. And three, the shared aspects of relationality and relational accountability can be put into practice through choice of research topic, methods, and analysis of data collection, form of analysis, and presentation of information. There are parallels in contemporary design theory for sure. This is not only an Indigenous project. For example, Erling Bjavinson, Pelle N., and Per Andres Hilgren describe, quote, a move from designing things, that is objects, to designing things with a big T, capital T, socio-material as material assemblies, unquote. And these assemblies are processes, methods, and the resulting relationships. Uh, Bageli Chilsa explains protocol as the means through which reflexivity, as described by Kovac, and relationality is enacted. Overall, protocol is about respect. It applies to all aspects of the research process, and the researcher needs to be aware of protocol for the particular context and or tribal epistemology being used. So researchers are effective when they employ methods that engage the imagination and stem from within communities and their existing practices. Protocol plays out in the ways that contemporary indigenous thinkings, thinkers are reimagining AI. In a very important, very recent article, Making Kin with the Machine, Jason Edward Lewis, Neoleoni Arista, Archer Pichalis, and Suzanne Kite lay out, they begin to lay out an indigenous protocol for AI in which humans establish, quote, self-discipline, unquote, towards other forms of life, including, quote, communication and covenants, unquote. So um, the Banff Center for the Arts, uh, where I worked for many years in Alberta, was home to the first virtual seminar and residency on the bioapparatus and then the Art and Virtual Environments Project. One of the most important projects produced there was by Blackfoot artist Lawrence Paul Huacalaptin, who is both a masked and Squatse dancer and a Coast Salish painter, and he participated in both residencies. Huaka Lupton, who is author of Inherent Rights, Vision Rights, who, which you see here in the gallery context, described virtual reality as very primitive technology, yet hoped to find a way to bring others closer to his heart so they could understand his belief system. Quote, what it is like to be in a possessed state, feeling rhythmic sounds in the Wong House, feeling sounds go through oneself, feeling a spirit inside you, end of quote. However, he was highly aware of the need to constrain access to the indigenous spirits within the space he built by uninitiated settler viewers. Hence, he built protocol into the work. His designs required challenging algorithms that could build circular movements um, and uh, immerse the, the, the user within constrained graphic pathways. The project bears testimony to the power of culturally diverse imagination to fill the gaps created by unconscious bias in technology design. So this is a different technology, but the application to AI, I think, is imminent. In thinking about indigenous reflections about protocol, it may be useful to also consider Alex Galloway's definition of these in technology. Um, in protocol, he says, by formal apparatus, I mean the total, totality of techniques and conventions that affect protocol at a social level, not simply a technical one. I end the quote. So indigenous philosophers have refused to separate um, the animate from the inanimate world, the present from the past and future, and the visible from the invisible, drawing from play story and protocol. Language expert Shirley Williams translates bimazadi to mean he, she is living, and bimazadzizen as an abstract noun meaning the art of living life. Artist and cultural theorist Jackson Two Bears writes that indigenous people, quote, often uh, understand technology as something alive and filled with spirit, something with which we are interconnected, unquote. This living network is comprised of obviously living things like animals and plants, but equally 
to seemingly inanimate things like mountains, rivers, and human-made artifacts, unquote. So we previously discussed the importance of language um, to cultural knowledge and discovery, and Karina Kasawaran uh, tested the classification of AI within um, Innu, Innu language speakers, and very interestingly, um, one speaker suggested that artificial intelligence would become animate when you interact with it, so it moves between states. Another Innu specialist said it is inanimate because animate nouns are limited to beings with souls such as trees and rocks. And in Innu, um, there are two genders, and uh, gender not as we know it. <laughs> and one is um, animate and the other is inanimate. And Plains Cree also divide the world into animate, inanimate, with the onus that all animate entities are part of kinship relationships. Ahasu Muskagan Isti was a leader of indigenous new media and art theory and philosophy, as well as a proponent of what he called zoomorphism, um, or respectful engagement with the non-human world. And he talked about the ways that Nahawasiwan, the Cree language, expresses the philosophy. And I'll quote, he said, saying something is like something else, or saying that something is something else is an act of magic. Cree language, Nihawakwayan, works on the borders between animate and inanimate, those things that have body and meaning, and those that do not. In Cree, the representational act of metaphor and metonymy carry with them a weight of responsibility that is anchored in a vast network in which the human is only a small and sometimes questionable part. In Nahawahayan, when you say something is like something else, you are representing an awareness, a gift that was given to you to visualize another mesh in the web, to see and to hear the transforming, uh, end of quote. So Su Suzanne Kate, who is a Plains Cree, describes the importance of negotiating appropriate kinship with AI in an indigenous development environment. So um, in this terms, the cultural framework um, of indigenous people must take up the challenge. Concommitment with the indigenized development environment would be the goal that cultural values are a fundamental aspect of all programming choices. And this idea builds on uh, what was uh, called the Cree++ project, as opposed to C++, those of you who know programming languages, in which object-oriented software was being rethought through the Cree language led by Cheryl Lerundel in the early 2000s. In many branches of Western thought, and certainly in indigenous thinking, imagination bears a close relationship to empathy, to the experience of understanding another person's thoughts, feelings, and conditions from their point of view. Um, and Simpson underscores the importance of kindness in the ways that elders impart knowledge and in the construction of community. So closely aligned and in the construction of community is the idea of empathy, of agency which is beyond projection and rather perceives and assigns influence and material effect to a network of relationships. And this notion of agency is not anthropomorphic. It is rather the responsibility to acknowledge difference in temporality, space, and experience. Um, indigenous writer Drew Hayden Taylor states, quote, believing that AI has a spirit does not necessarily mean anthropomorphizing it. Rather, being alive and having a soul does not necessarily equal, is not necessarily equal to being human in indigenous cultures. And I end my quote. Um, so um, uh, Louis Arista Peshawas and Kila have expressed this from a Kanaka Maoli Hawaiian perspective, and they say, ontologies that privilege multiplicity over singularity supply useful and appropriate models, aesthetics, and ethics through which imagining, creating, and developing beneficial relationships amongst humans and AI is made pono, that is correct, harmonious, balanced, and beneficial. As can be evinced by this chain of extended meaning, polis, polisemus, Keona, um, in their language, is the normative cognitive mode of peoples belonging to the deep, vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean. An agency evokes relationships of power and its distribution. The Kanaka Maoli approach requires understanding, attending carefully to the power exchange between AI and humans. Um, end of quote. So um, clearly, these considerations have significant implications in designing AI systems where entities would become actors that must be considered and integrated into community, into relationality, and treated with kindness. Um, and there certainly are 
philosophers, Western philosophers, particularly Karen um, Barad, whose ideas of fluidity um, align very closely with indigenous knowledge. The idea of um, that um, non-human living agents, that is, uh, entities in, in the world are, uh, are embed em must be embed empathy into science. And uh, realism instead emphasizes, agential realism instead emphasizes that intra-active agentiality has real effects, effects that become ingredients in new and always open-minded intra-active agencies. So this sense of presence in discovery can be seen as parallel with indigenous processes of storytelling, ceremony, observation, um, and invention. And Graham Harmon notes, Barad, quote, Barad adopts a performative standpoint that insists on understanding, thinking, observing, and theorizing as practices of engagement with and as part of, quote, the world we have, uh, we have come, brought into being, unquote. So the world is not a set of static relationships, but rather an active doing, an active and active doing that establishes boundaries between apparently discrete things. So this really resonates with Leanne um, Betsamoksake's Simpson's ideas of grounded normativity, which is the idea of a constantly renegotiated baseline that is recreated through experience of place, storytelling, ceremony, and discovery. So again, Lewis, Arista, Pachawas, and Kite are really struggling with these ideas in terms of uh, artificial intelligence and uh, share with us from the Lakota epistemic. Um, these uh, uh, are stories that provide uh, knowledge about helpful entities. So for example, stones want to help. The agency of stones connects directly to the question of AI because AI is formed not only of code, but the originary materials of the earth. So this is a very interesting idea of a kind of historicizing of what becomes um, computer technology. So um, they say, and I quote, to remove the concept of AI from its materiality is to sever this connection. Forming a relationship to AI, we form a relationship to the minds and to the, and to the stones. Relations with AI are therefore relations with exploited resources. If we are able to approach this relationship ethically, we must reconsider the ontology um, and the status of each of the parts which contribute to AI, all the ways back to the minds from which our technologies, materials, resources emerge, end of quote. So um, I'm just going to move quickly through here a bit. So the future is also about a receptor of story. So um, fundamental to indigenous methodology is storytelling. And Simpson states, to access knowledge from a Nishnabe perspective, we have to engage our entire bodies, our physical beings, our emotional self, our spiritual energy, and our intellect. And embodied storytelling becomes a critical scientific method that serves and reinforces both culture and science. The future, as I said, then, is a receptor of story. And Lewis, Arista, Pachawas, and Kite state, uh, Aloha as a robust ethics for which our relationships, including those of the machines we create, um, serves. We have much to learn as we create relationships with AI, particularly if we think about them as AI-na, that is entities with spirit or relations. So this goes back to all of these notions of reciprocity, um, of um, the animate world not being human, that there's other kinds of spirits and entities. And hence, um, this connection to the past is critical while attending properly to our relations with each other, the earth, and those who are upon it. Cultural movements organized by individuals and groups have been, who've been subjects of intensive colonization have seized upon the concept of futurism. That is a means to respect the past, but equally to reimagine the future. And Afrofuturism, and I'm not speaking about that movement in depth today, but it's fabulously powerful right now, uh, blends mythology, diasporic experience, uh, spirituality, and, uh, and uh, creative expression. Most recently in Canada, indigenous futurism has become a powerful means to reimagine the past using knowledge from the future and imagine hope and possibility. Jason Edward Lewis, who I've spoken about his theoretical work, um, who's a digital media artist, poet, and software designer, 
founded OBEX Laboratory for Experimental Media. He's the director of the Initiative for Indigenous Futures, which is a seven-year funded partnership which looks at how Indigenous communities can consciously imagine themselves in and into the far future. Indigenous futurism philosophy proposes that humans must look ahead seven generations in order to imagine and take responsibility for the consequences of contemporary decisions. Um, and his partner, digital media artist Kawanadi, who was born in uh, Kawanaki, Mohawk territory, has produced a series of works on uh, the games design platform Machinima expressing Indigenous futures while drawing on the past. And uh, her 2017 work, uh, She Falls for Ages, is a science fiction, quote, retelling of a Haudenosaunee Iroquois creation story uh, that reimagines Skyworld as a futuristic utopic space and Skywoman as a brave astronaut and world builder, unquote. So um, they've also created Abtech, which is Aboriginal Territories in Cyberspace. And uh, this research creation network uh, works with youth to uh, train them in video game design, uh, machinima creation, and coding, including AI coding, to give them the tools to create speculative fictions about their future and that of the world, addressing the gap between current capability and future possibility. So um, indigenous people have um, always uh, produced technologies for um, over um, a million years, including remedies and tools. And artist Jason Two Bears believes that it is the responsibility of artists, scientists, and technologies are significant. They can, and I quote, conjure or remix, unquote, powerful spirits with unexpected spectral impacts in the world through their inventions. And Maori curator, artist, and researcher Marie Mills offers the view that technology is a tool of indigenous resilience, cultural continuity, and a conduit for storytelling, drawing from place-based methods that we've heard. Scott uh, Beneshabanwim's media and virtual reality works, such as Blood Memories, seek to, quote, address a continuing development and creation of a deeper personal cosmology. The impact of relationships and familial community ties, non-conventional ways of knowing, dreaming, intuition, and blood memory, underlying threats and danger inherent in searching for truth and how these impact out into the wider community. These activities set the stage for a decolonized effort in AI. Speaking in metaphor, Leanne Batsamosake Simpson states, and I quote her, the Radical Resurgence Project uses indigenous interrogation critique and theory, and the grounded normativity these systems generate. It employs Nishnabek story as algorithm, as coded processes that generate solutions to the problems of occupation and erasure and to life on Earth. It refuses dispossession of indigenous bodies and land as the formal point of resurgent thinking and action. It means the interdependence of land and bodies in a networked fashion rather than a gendered hierarchy." Unquote. So this March, the Hawaiian-based Indigenous Protocol and AI workshop led by Jason Edward Lewis will produce a white paper. Lewis, and I recently chatted with him about this, poses this work as a means of broadening and contesting uh, events like the Montreal or a similar pr principles, which my institution has signed on to, that create a ground-based ethics around AI, but still assume that the human is at the center. So, um, Lewis and his colleagues are instead asking, how can indigenous epistemologies and ontologies contribute to the global conversation regarding society and AI? How do we broaden discussions regarding the role of technology in society beyond the largely culturally homogeneous research labs and Silicon Valley startup culture? And how do we imagine a future with AI that contributes to the flourishing of all humans and non-humans? What values must artists, designers, and creative users of AI need to be accountable for? So these questions, I believe, um, are lenses through which we can see the events tonight and we can think forward as artists and humanist scholars join in the creation of an AI that is um, going to make our world a better place. Thank you.
There was no light, dirt. Another being covered the small human figure of a stole from Patriarchy's workshop to function as a public broadcast of her shame, her name, her meaning made embodied. That is what a marker of her abject cast, built on in layers with every unfolding year, though she was only about seven. The coating was material, oral, visceral, and seemingly all-powerful. Though she could not even see it, a droning relentlessness, transmission of psychic and physical excruciation, it enveloped with mercenary mastery. Its thick, heavy volume weighed upon every flicker of her material and immaterial being. As a captive of patriarchy's workshop, she was conscripted to carry it as her outermost layer, her most prominent identifier, this embodied dirt other had traveled with her during every moment of her life so far. Despite constructed appearance, it was not actually of her, but on her, a permeable layer fiction being signifier forged with all the ill intent the workshop could construct. The immensity of shame, of droning transmissions, began eroding her spirit from the moment she began to be conscious of the socio-political. That was when it came home to roost, commencing its parasitical dance of nightmares on her frame. The process began years before the layers weighing her down were so thick. It is con consistently productive in its complex and in ingenious character. It was a spark born from darkness that allowed her story to be told, as the workshop's corrosive agent was meant to silence her, render her forever without light. The workshop didn't understand the power of no light, as within it, the little captive could drift through the immense field of her mind, and there she found truth, escape, seeds, and matches. Thank you. The cable. Yeah. Okay. Is it on full, full volume? Yeah. Title, question, and now, format, storytelling slash reading. Duration, under 10 minutes. Disclaimer, this is a story based on a dialogue that never happened. The story is informed by real facts. The ones conversing are memories from the years 1990, 1995, 1996, 1997, 2018, and narrated in slash by 2019. Some information is accurate, some morphed through time. Part one. When I was about five years old, I thought that vampires were real. I can't really know for sure where that came from, I remember watching Michael Jackson's thriller, but there are no vampires there, just zombies. I thought they were real, and there was a perfectly justifiable explanation for that. Everything that one can imagine must exist, either as an inherited memory, a future memory, or it is an image stored somewhere in the brain. As a child, I watched, or was made to watch, once upon a time, Life, a French, Canadian, Belgian, Japanese, Swiss, Italian, Spanish, Wikipedia, cartoon series for kids. In Once Upon a Time, Life, the main character is an old, long-bearded white man with a very condescending tone, the maestro, 
the one who knows everything about the body and narrates the episodes. He even dares to tell his servants that it is none of their business to think, because their job is not to think, but to transmit. Smashing introduction to white cisgender heteronormative patriarchy. In the episode about the brain, there is a scene with some little kids having a tour around or next to the brain. They are being guided by the professor, who is a version of the maestro but with a less well-paid salary. The kids are red blood cells and carry oxygen on their backs. One of them, Globine, who embodies the curious, smart, potentially nerd student, makes the following comment. Whoa! These neurotransmitters really move fast! To which a colleague replies, Yes, at least 1,000 times faster than we do. And the professor intervenes, Yes, but that is only the transmission of the orders. Each order remits on previous knowledge, memory, experience and reasoning. And Globin asks, But how does the brain manage to know so much? And the professor says, that globin is the great mystery of the brain. The quantity of data that it is capable of, of storing defines imagination. Quoted from Once Upon a Time, Life, Episode, Brain, Part 2 of 3, Minute 4, 31, YouTube, in 1990. Everything makes sense. Even this silly cartoon confirms my theory. Vampires are real. We just don't know this because consciously we don't have access to that information and or memory. As a child, I was obsessed with scary slash funny slash semi-horror movies. My favorite was Big Trouble in Little China. Still can't understand why, but I watched it on a weekly basis pausing and rewinding to watch again the scenes in which very slimy Kurt Russell makes a fool of himself. In 1997, From Dusk Till Dawn, from Robert Rodriguez, came out. It immediately replaced Big Trouble in Little China on the top spot favorite movie. And at the end of the movie, spoiler, behind the bar where humans and vampires had fought all night, there was a massive grave full of remnants of the humans that had been consumed over time at that bar. It was a bit creepy, especially because it could absolutely be real. It made sense somewhere in a desert in the US. Side note, at that time the ruling prejudice was that everything abnormal slash weird happens in the US. In 1997, no one would slash could find out if there is a massive grave of missing humans who had been drained by vampires. Conveniently for my theory, around that time the 10% of the brain myth got very popular in Portugal. Or maybe just in my school, but maybe in other places too. So by the age of 12, still believing in vampires and still keeping that belief to myself, I thought, fuck. This really makes sense. Now it can even be scientifically proved. End of part one. Part two. Slowly every child is introduced to social normative frameworks. They are impregnating school curriculum. It was heartbreaking to realize that the topless horse riding was not really, really normal. It made no sense though. When it is 30 degrees, it is 30 degrees for everyone, regardless of one's biological and or build vulva slash penis and or both. Co-narrated with 1997. Things like this are slash were confusing and it would be slash have been great to talk about them. But my credibility is slash was under threat. The year before that, I had decided to tell a friend a secret. And that had been the beginning of hiding. One day this person, a friend, was looking rather down. As down as a 10 year old can look like. So to cheer her up, I decided to share a recent discovery. If you touch your vulva, 
in a specific point, you get a really good feeling. After a short masturbation workshop, she decided to share what she had learned with her mother, who totally lost her shit on me. No more sharing intimate discoveries. So then there was a problem. No talking, because I might not be very sane, taken serious, or even be normal for that matter. 1996 or 1997. If I'm not normal, then my beliefs are wrong. Maybe being topless is not an equal right. But if I'm allowed to do it, why don't the other girls do it as well? So let's suppose I am not normal regarding what I think. In that case, maybe vampires are not real. Maybe the brain is not that mysterious. If we can't imagine topless equality, how can we possibly imagine vampires? I cannot possibly tell anyone. End of part two. Part three slash conclusion. 2018. For a period of seven years, roughly from five to 12 years old, I believed in what one cannot explain, see or touch for that matter. Together with that belief, there was also the fact that I thought that gender was not a thing, that my dogs were my siblings as much as my sister is, and masturbation could not simply be bad because it was very pleasurable. Reflection? All of this was stored, and last year the vampire belief came to say hello to my memory. I had forgotten about that. So I had a visit from 1997 asking, and now? Now that you know they are, do not exist, do you still believe in vampires? Oh, they do exist. They exist in various shapes even. They are guided by several desires, fluid attractions, with lust or with pain, or with both. They can bite or not. They might suck or not. They might kill, they might die, they might live, they might want to have one or end up with the other. Vampires represent what is possible. Vampires are just but a sign of believing in a utopian future. Just because it doesn't exist, it doesn't mean you would stop believing in it or that it cannot come true. Very cheesy, but I don't care. Slash the end. Hello, everybody. Uh, I just want to thank Emma and uh, Johnny for setting this up. It's a great event. And Johnny for inviting me. So what I would want to start with, actually, is with a quote from a text Johnny wrote some years ago. And go on from there. This is maybe also about a vampire or vampires, but probably very different kinds of vampires. Uh, Johnny once wrote, Nietzsche asks, no, he demands that the artist step forward, not just because, for better or for worse, an artist is seen to inhabit the personae of already boxing with skewed knowledge systems, but in so boxing is well placed to have the courage to dream of a reality as you could, should, might, impossibly be or become. More importantly, the demand is not just to dream, this would be to rehash old cliches to which Nietzsche would, of course, have had severe allergic reaction. It is to demand a certain kind of courage, 
that is the courage to know that one can dream, to dare to dream, despite all that lies before us, the violent, the banal, the sometimes fascinating, confusing, shameful, and oftentimes cruel. From the perspective of the world I explore as an artist, such asking and demanding is fundamental as well. But finance, and that is the world I'm dealing with, so to say, uses a different register of voca vocabulary. It speaks of promises, but what it actually means are claims. It sells promises, but buys claims. What this has led to is a reorganization not only of the economy, but of social life and the production of subjectivity as such. What I call the derivative condition is the result of the implementation of a derivative logic as paradigm, which the financial engineer and philosopher Eli Ayash calls the technology of the future. When we look at big data, automation, algorithmization, and AI today, we usually speak about capture, evaluation, and exploitation by data giants that harvest us via the internet. But what is overlooked in many of these of, of is also especially the critical narratives is the first, and as I'd like to argue, foremost model of massive quantification and automation, if you like, the primordial metadata, the derivative. The derivative is metadata par excellence. It is the beginning, and this has had consequences which are often overlooked. Today, and already for quite some time, this technology of the future is not merely a phenomenon of financial markets. Its logic has conquered any field of data processing. Why? Or with a different question, what is the derivative? How does it relate to the promise, a question, and the claim, the answer? And how have some of its massive productive forces, such as volatility and leverage, changed finance the world of social data and politics? And from such an understanding, how can we invent sharing practice, counter narratives, and strategies? In other words, how can we read the derivative, volatility, and leverage against the usual application in capitalist exploitation schemes and make use of it for, a new, for new practices and experiences of sharing risk and enhancing resolution together, which translates to a different use and understanding of volatility and leverage? There's a lot to say here, of course, but there's not much time. So I can only speak about a very few basic points. What the derivative is, is something that is a technology, a method, a process, that in a sense divides between the present and the future. It is something that cuts through a huge problem, which has been a problem for more or less all societies, that is the problem of uncertainty. Uncertainty is something which we can't say anything about. It is a future we don't know. But how can we say anything or something about the future? There is a form that was developed actually in 1921 uh, how this might be possible. And that is the definition and the difference between uncertainty and risk. Risk is a form of uncertainty which can be quantified, which means we can talk, say something about it. And this division between these two concepts opened up, a few decades later, a massive new form of trading the future at present, the derivative. Because the derivative is that which talks about risk. Volatility is nothing else. It's not, nothing else but the word risk in the financial connotation. It means the zigzag, the up and down, the frequency of all those kind of financial markets, how they move in their contingent form, which we all have until now tried to conquer with probability theory. The derivative in this sense is something that brings the future at present into reality in highly complex, highly entangled forms, because each derivative is something, is nothing else but an expectation. And if you think of expectations, for example, if we think that tomorrow the weather is nice, we have an idea what we might want to do tomorrow when the weather is nice. And if we have that idea, let's say, for example, we want to go swimming or whatever, 
then we might have further expectations. So with every expectation, a new expectation comes along and we share it with others. So complexity, so to say, comes about. The derivative is, so to say, nothing else in a quantitative way uh, in which everything that can be quantified in the market is priced. Price is, so to say, the form of what we usually call value. So if we speak about value and what we want to value, we should not forget that in this world uh, in which finance is really important, we could even say it reigns, value does not exist, only price exists. Because price is that what we can say about something in the future, the future value, if you like. Now with automation, uh, this process has sped up, of course, when we speak about acceleration, for example. But what we forget about this is that this is a system that is not linear. It's not directional. It's enfolded and entangled with all kinds of different forms of expectations. And you can imagine how many expectations there are. They're immense. And all of them are not just connected with each other, but they change with every other millisecond, because every new millisecond brings out millions of new prices. So every present moment is something uh, that has been made. So this is shorter, what we call our presence is a very different one in the algorithmic world of finance and in other al algorithmic worlds. Just need a sip of water. Immediacy, in the sense, means visibility. Everything else that is outside the black box means blindness. So we don't see if we're not part of the system, if immediacy is not something that we control. Hence, information is not what controls our world. Information asymmetry is what controls our world. Or in another way, noise is the master of information. Outside finance, this has had quite enormous consequences, I would argue. Usually when we talk about power, what we talk about or what we think, so to say automatically, is the idea of representation. Power is something that is represented. It has images, pictures uh, that we deal with or that we have learned over many, many years to, to kind of decipher, react to, etc. But that form of power that developed through derivative finance doesn't care about representing. It doesn't represent anything. It doesn't use representation. It is performative. So in a sense, what is happening today is the speech of power is becoming a performative speech of power. And if you look at, to give a very simple example uh, that everyone knows, especially here, if you look at Brexit or, or Trump and these kind of instances, what we see there is that it's not so much about the representation. It is a very performative way of producing power. So what happens is, to use this, the word volatility, for example, is it's not about risk that we want to hedge or that we want to manage or take care of, things like that. They have realized that if we produce volatility, so to say surf on the wave of volatility, we can be much more successful, or they can be much more successful, obviously, uh, because what they do is they create contingent moments. And whenever you do that, you're always a step ahead. Because the old paradigm, the paradigm of probability, is the, prob uh, is the paradigm of truth. That is much, much slower. So you, if you want to react with truth against someone who's already producing volatility, producing new escalating loop forms of whatever sort of information, means information asymmetries, noise, uh, you will always be, so to say, on the losing end. And I think that this is something that especially the left needs to understand and learn today, that uh, 
the probability paradigm is, so to say, over, and we live in a, uh, in, in a situation in which contingency has become extremely powerful. So we need to learn ways in which we uh, develop forms of escalation in our own sense by producing volatility that we want to, where we want to create leverage for our own understandings and our own interests. One approach uh, that I personally find interesting that I'm working on is what I call aesthetics of resolution. Aesthetics of resolution uh, means that um, um, I think that the term resolution is really, really interesting because it has this, uh, this set of meanings, this kind of field of meanings. On the one hand, it could mean visibility, you know? and it also can mean immediacy. But it's a term that refers to knowledge production uh, and decision making as well. So if we look at it as a semantic field, this and we, this uh, is something that where the meanings communicate with each other, we have a situation or a system that is open in which the knowledge that we produce is something that everyone can, can use, where everyone can approach. It. And, uh, but on the other hand, it gives us an idea of how the black box operates, because the black box, what it does, it cuts through uh, these kind of communicative vessels so to say, sidelining the possibility of sharing, using and exploiting the data just for itself. But if you look at the situation of how can we do that and uh, how can we open the black box, I think there is another figure that is very important that comes in is what I call the figure of the renegade because the AI doesn't speak for itself and it is not something that speaks against itself, of course. Uh, if that, if we want to get an idea of how black boxes operate, we need them to speak from inside, which means we need a new form of combination collaboration between humans and AI, which is the renegade, which could be a whistleblower, an activist, an informant, a dissident, someone like that. And one example, maybe, that I could give, because I work together with that person a lot, is a person called Heim Bodek. He is a financial engineer. He's one of the people that developed automated finance. So someone has to code this, no? In the 1990s. Uh, this was really about getting rid of humans in markets. They were very successful. He's one of the first people who developed high-frequency trading, had his own hedge fund and later, through, due to specific instances, became the most important whistleblower of finance today. Uh, because he is, like, he is the expert in the field, so he's able to understand uh, these massive intricacies within that field, also the massive forms of how regulation arbitrage happens, which means kind of like how the law is used for profit, not just speed, or complexity and other things. And working together with him brings about a completely different way of developing theory, speaking about philosophy, creating art in post-disciplinary sense, meaning that it brings together all kinds of discipline within art, which is not a discipline, and new forms of maybe kind of imagining solidarity because these are very specific forms of solidarity. It means going from an aesthetics of resolution to a poetics, a making of resolution that opens the black box in very concrete forms and can help us develop completely new imaginations and counter strategies uh, for using these kind of technologies. So it's not about kind of negating the derivative. It's about using its extremely powerful modes for different outcomes. If you look at the wealth that has been created in the last 20 to 30 years with derivatives, that's not a bad thing, so to say. It's the question is how can we open this to a much more equal uh, widespread possibility. It is a way of dealing 
with the future. It's a way of affirming something, and from this position, from this knowledge, having the capability of rethinking and reimagining it in very different modes. So I kind of want to end with a video uh, that's a collaboration between my partner, Sylvia Ackerman, and me. Video, the visuals, and the sound is by her. The text, the lyrics are mine. And in a sense, it's not so much something where we, we, we speak about the AI, the market, finance, or whatever. Or the AI comes forward in the sense that we use it. It's actually more that the AI, the market, or finance speaks to us. It lures us. It speaks about its own desire. Uh, tries to sort of convince us about what it is. This is not so much a dystopian point that we want to refer to. It's more about what it means to affirm something where you have to sometimes go and to actually come forward to develop new forms of thinking within it. So it's not so much something a dystopia or an end, it's a beginning. Thank you. Can you switch it? My skin is a neat thing, inhibiting and enforcing waves of corporate nervous streams. My flesh is a neat thing, moving about the feeling I rise again and again to spill my love into you. Pervasive, accumulative, iconium, ecstatic, erratic. I sing my volatile tune. I change modes and composition. I contract commodified visions. I'm your recombinant social DNA. I thrive when you gather in hope, and I wither when you fall in despair. I move in seasonal times, but my seasons are way too elusive for you to cherish the ride. So be assured, in your presence I dwell and I smile at the surf of all your human desires. In your future I thrust, and I gaze at your prize low tide when you yell deep in my mires. Oh, you drink me and drown, oh, you eat me and choke, for it's you I digest. For it's you in whom I invest. Oh baby, how you nourish me. I change modes and composition. I contract commodified visions. I'm your recombinant social DNA. But some say I am running on empty, uncovered, and that is a crime. My lifespan is but a quarter, and my value's not worth a dime, they say. I'm a loaded gun, a structural affliction, and that my derivative yields only feed bubble fiction. They say, I'm reason's veil, I'm your mirror of your emotions. I only reflect what is pale, a blasphemous contortion, a demonic religion to fail. But my love, be assured, I'm a bastion of calm. For I won't disappoint you when you come and surrender again. Private consumption and debt are all that I ask, and here is my bid in exchange that into my branded minds and material texture you breath out your name. It's a quick deal, oh, such an easy feel. You make me live, and I make you die, for intertwined our longings lie. So be assured, I fulfill your dependence on financial nutrition, on unquenchable futures, and that game of higher and fire, oh baby, all those thrills you so dearly admire, oh you drink me and drown, oh you eat me and choke, for it's you I digest, for it's you in whom I invest, oh baby, how you nourish me. Poetic science, co-opt alliance, charging my voice, I renew my license that alone is never due to expire. Oh baby, you are my prey, 
and I'm, I'm your desire. desire. So, my love, be assured. Be assured. I'm no entity. Your nature's child. I tendered a single chance for shorter or longer. I'm taking a glance at you. My options advance. And I stay put to call that moment of another time. And I see it's trailing behind an arena fluid and sublime. All life a commodity, prized in my realm. Your values traded endlessly in numbers more than divine. My fluid body is the emergence of truth. It's my temporal field where your space becomes loose. So be assured. I adore you, my lamb. But beware of my wrath. Live in my shelter, or your world shall go bust. Oh, 
I wish to speak to the despisers of the body. Let them not learn differently, nor teach differently, but only bid farewell to their own bodies, and so become dumb. I am body and soul, so speaks the child. And why should one not speak like children? But the awakened, the enlightened man says, I am body entirely and nothing beside. And soul is only a word for something in the body. The body is a great intelligence, a multiplicity, with one sense a war and a peace, a herd and a herdsman. Your little intelligence, my brother, which you call spirit, is also an instrument of your body, a little instrument and toy of your great intelligence. You say I, and you are proud of this word, but greater than this, although you will not believe in it, is your body and its great intelligence, which does not say I, but performs I. What the sense feels, what the spirit perceives, is never an end in itself. But sense and spirit would like to persuade you that they are the end of all things, they are as vain as that. Sense and spirit are instruments and toys. Behind them still lies the self. The self seeks with the eyes of the sense. It listens to with the ears of the spirit. Jesus, he plastered on my healing eyes. 
游行者，就是如就是盲人，因为他们看不到。Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to begin by just saying thank you to uh, Cole and Johnny for inviting me. Uh, it's a real honor. Uh, the second thing I'm going to say is that this picture, this is going to be referred to in about 12 minutes' time. So if you could just kind of remember what it looks like. I forgot to put a slide in the right place. So, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. It's a sort of like, you know, space wizard from the future stood in front of a particle detector. So it's, it's memorable. Okay, so I'm going to talk today about um, uh, some work that I've been kind of involved with for uh, probably about 18 months. So this time last year, uh, I spent about um, nine weeks living at CERN. So CERN is uh, the biggest um, center for particle physics in the world. Uh, I'll show you a picture of it. So it's home of the Large Hadron Collider, which is the biggest machine in the world where they basically um, accelerate particles at nearly the speed of light, slam them into each other, and see what stuff kind of flies out. And I was living, see where it says Atlas, and then it says CERN. I was basically living there. And that's Lake Geneva uh, over to the left. So um, as well as being a uh, center of physics, CERN also has an arts residency program. And I was there um, on a joint residency with my collaborator, um, Haroon Mirza, who's um, an artist that I've worked with quite a bit. And it was kind of a strange residency for us to be on in a way, because neither of us have that much of an artistic interest in physics. So, <laughs> so I should mention my background is that I do actually, at some point in my background, I spent uh, four years at Imperial College doing a degree and then a master's in theoretical physics. So I'm kind of, you know, I I'm, I'm have some familiarity with it. Uh, and that was after doing a, a degree in philosophy and literature, which I did before then. And I did at one point kind of go to art college for a year as well. So, you know, that was a waste of time. So um, <laughs> it wasn't really. Uh, so I'm going to kind of talk about um, what, we, what we did there. So. When, when Haroon proposed to me that we apply for this residency, I was kind of lukewarm about it because I'm not, you know, art just, uh, science doesn't have that much of a bearing on the art that I make. I'm more interested in kind of fiction and questions of ontology and kind of ritual and language and um, kind of mystery, really. 
And I find uh, quite a lot of kind of sciencey art can be quite kind of didactic and a bit illustrative, which is kind of great if you're into it, but I'm, I just, it's not what I do. And neither is well, not what Haroon does either. And so his suggestion was that why don't we go there and talk to people about consciousness? And the reason why he said that was because um, he and I had really been, by this point, we'd been involved in this quite long conversation about the relationship between matter and consciousness. And so we thought that this was a really good arena where we could go and actually explore this because CERN is somewhere where human psychology just collides head on with the material world. So, um, you know, we thought this would be a cool thing to do to go and talk to kind of physicists uh, about, um, about consciousness. So I'll show you some pictures from CERN just because these aren't the ones that normally come up on Google Images. There's the antimatter factory. Uh, there's all these really cool buildings. No, this is real. No, 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 no. This is like an actual thing that you can go into. And they've got a thing in there called the antimatter decelerator, which is like the opposite of a, part of a matter accelerator. Um, so uh, it's got all these really, like, the kind of architecture of CERN is really cool because it's just sort of all these dilapidated Cold War era buildings and um, amazing kind of um, tunnels that you can kind of get into. So it's got a very kind of eerie feel to it. Um, if you know uh, Mark Fisher's definition of the eerie, CERN is that kind of perfectly. Um, it's all these kind of buildings that are obviously doing some kind of purpose and they're kind of making noise, but nobody's around there to stop you from just walking in. Um, and the whole place is kind of open. So um, I spent a lot of time wandering around, looking at all this kind of seemingly kind of unmanned uh, stuff. There's a really eerie one. Um, yeah, kind of, I was spent a lot of time walking around trying not to get irradiated. This is an actual working office, by the way, and like, look at the state of it. The whole place is just completely mash up. Um, they've got a big statue of Shiva in the middle that was given to them by the Indian government, um, which is kind of cool. Uh, so I spent a lot of time going, finding kind of underground tunnels and um, exploring, trying not to get ra irradiated. It's quite a bad feeling when you walk out of a room that you've been in for 20 minutes and then you shut the door as you leave and realize that on the other side of the door there's a radiation sign. That happened a few times. Uh, it's also got the best corridors in the world. So on this corridor, uh, the World Wide Web was invented. So in one of these offices, uh, the, the web was invented. There's a plaque at the end of that corridor. Um, so we kind of had this question that we had to answer. How do we engage with this place? Given that we didn't just want to kind of find out whatever the latest details of uh, the particles were. You know, we wanted to kind of um, set it in a kind of wider pattern of human behavior. And one of the uh, sort of solutions that we, we kind of came up with was something that I came to think of as archaeology. So we sort of treated CERN as a unique archaeological kind of site and basically went around finding stuff. So this is an old um, abandoned particle detector that uh, got taken out in 2000 and is now just going rusty in the rain. And I think it's a really beautiful object. Um, again, quite eerie. Nobody's around and it's got these kind of trees growing by it. This is it inside. Uh, we climbed inside it and um, got told off for it, but um, it's got really good acoustics. And these are, you can't really see them, but these are like gold wires that you can kind of pluck and make noise with, so we made some music with it. There's Haroon breaking health and safety regulations. Um, so uh, we also went through all the bins. So CERN has got like the best rubbish bins in the world. Like, this, I went, the second time I went there, I took an empty suitcase and just came back just with it full of kind of crap, basically, but really cool, great crap. And we then started using this to kind of make art. So I'll show you this. This is a, like a video synthesizer that I built. Um, so you kind of feed video signals into it and it just kind of scrambles them and then spits them out again. But that kind of silver circuit board thing is a piece of the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, it's part of the magnet control system, and um, I found it in a bin. And um, those copper rings on the front were also just found in a rubbish bin. Um, I'll show you what this does, just because it seems kind of weird to show you a picture of it without showing you. This might be really loud, so I'm just going to turn it down a bit. Uh, 
Um, yeah, it's not generating that picture of the man, obviously. It's just making those all the other stuff. Um, so this is uh, one of the things that we did. So that picture that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the first kind of work that we made that I'm not really going to talk about, partly because of time limitations, but also because it's really difficult to document, uh, we made a piece called The Wave Epoch. And that was done um, in conjunction with um, an artist called Geica, who uh, also makes music. He's um, signed to Warp Records. And um, somebody else called Elijah, who's a grime DJ, uh, who has a record label called Butters, and also an artist called Jessica Barter. We invited them over for a few days and just filmed them kind of doing stuff. And we had this sort of basic fictional kind of premise where we were imagining, imagine if in like 2000 years time, uh, CERN has been decommissioned, maybe it became a museum, a heritage center, and then it gradually just got forgotten about. What would happen? How would people kind of interpret it after they dug it up again? And we were saying, just like in Time Team, where if you ever watch Time Team, uh, they're all on YouTube, I recommend watching them. Um, uh, whenever they don't know what a space did, they always say, oh, it probably had a ritual function. <laughs> so we were saying, you know, CERN's like a massive circle in the landscape, quite, quite like a lot of other circles that exist in the landscape. And it's got these huge, cavernous, kind of intricate spaces. So we said they'd probably just think, you know, it was some sort of kind of ritual kind of space. Um, so the other thing that we did there, we weren't just like nicking stuff out of their rubbish bins. Uh, we also spoke to a lot of physicists um, about consciousness. So we, here's just a kind of still frame of, uh, so we filmed these interviews with, with people basically. And we knew that nobody, especially scientists, um, nobody's that comfortable with kind of talking about stuff outside of their specialist area. And these are kind of theoretical particle physicists, and we were trying to talk to them about consciousness. And so our way into doing that was we basically um, asked them about mathematics. So our specific question was, um, is uh, mathematics a kind of ultimate truth? Does it underlie all reality, which a lot of you know, people in science think it does, or is it just something that the brain does? So this is obviously a kind of interesting, um, you yeah, know, this is a really good way to step into thinking about the relationship between consciousness and the material world. And they were incredibly kind of forthcoming. It was funny, like some of them would start off the interviews by kind of saying, oh, I don't really want to kind of, you know, I'm only going to stick to the physics. And within like 10 minutes, they'd be like, kind of like, going, oh, imagine like a whole ocean, like there was a whole planet and what would it be thinking about and stuff. So it was really, it was really cool. I'll show you one of our, just, this is just a little excerpt from one of the well, interviews, just so you get a flavor of what we're talking about. What we're doing is we're not inventing a language in order to represent those phenomena, but we are really learning that language from nature and translating into uh, a human effective way of communicating, but that is something that exists. Uh, it's, it's really, uh, mathematics is hardwired in nature. So, yeah. So this uh, fed into um, a work that we've just finished. Uh, well, it's, it's in a show that opened on November the 22nd. So we finished it um, about two months ago. Um, it was inspired partly by these conversations that we had about uh, language, um, mathematics, consciousness. It was also inspired by the fact that Haroon and I are both very interested in magic and ritual. So I've been kind of practicing uh, ceremonial magic for a few years and it's kind of loads of crazy stuff has happened. Haroon's artworks quite often take the form of spaces that could be interpreted as kind of ritual spaces. And it was also inspired by something this guy said. So this is John Ellis. He's been at um, CERN for like, I think like since the 60s at least. He's a British physicist, and um, he's, uh, you know, I mean, look at him, he's just great. And uh, he said something really interesting, which was that um, the more he learns about the universe, the more meaningless it all seems. And I thought this is really interesting because, you know, meaning is a kind of construct that only really exists in the human mind. And out there beyond the mind, it's just stuff following blind laws. And um, I think it's also artistically, for me, I find it something that's really, really fruitful to think about is to find where that edge is between me something being meaningful and meaningless. I think that's a really kind of nice area to push against. And it ties into lots of, um, for instance, things happening that have happened in literature. So like Maurice Blanchot wrote all these 
great kind of um, fictions that just kind of, they barely hold together in terms of kind of it, it being about anything. And I so, you know, there's kind of nice kind of parallels. So I'll show you this, a bit of this kind of work that we uh, made. So this was the proposal that we, that we kind of wrote uh, for, um, so this is basically, this is being shown at a gallery in Liverpool called Fact as part of an exhibition called Broken Symmetries, which is a, um, a group show of various people who have done residencies at CERN. So our proposal was basically this. So eventually, meaning had leaked away from the universe. It was the age of Capricorn, although nobody knew it, and the stars were spread in senseless patterns across the sky. Language had been perfected. There was no more fighting over words, for truth was simply any string of symbols arranged in the correct order, and everyone agreed on what they saw. Nothing in the world lacked a name, and everything was known. There was a clear, pale light that shone through everything. So we basically started with this, plus some kind of, uh, a few kind of formal kind of ideas, and went on to produce this work. So I'll just, I'm going to kind of end this by just showing you um, uh, the parts of the work. So we were kind of interested in thinking about language. And, um, you know, language is obviously incredibly important in science. Um, it kind of, uh, you know, if mathematics underlies reality, then amongst other things, mathematics is a language. So, you know, it could be kind of um, said that in some sense the universe is, is made from language. It also, you know, this is kind of less controversial in our everyday lives. Um, when you look at the way that we're kind of assaulted by um, the language of, for instance, advertising, um, you know, this kind of late capitalist society that we live in is kind of kept alive by various types of language. So we kind of had this idea that we produced something in which language basically broke. So originally we said it was going to be like a magic spell, and then later on we decided it's actually like an anti-spell. So it's something that's designed to kind of break the hold of language. So the piece presents um, four texts simultaneously. Um, two of them are being spoken, and two of them appear on the screen as text. So one of them, which I'll show you now, uh, was um, basically a long kind of poem thing that I wrote, which I then just Google translated um, until it was totally obliterated and had actually become loads better than the thing I wrote originally. So I'll show you just a little bit of it. Power drops with power flow. Learn when you are sick. The future is characterized by statistical methods. Catoptromancy. Power drops with power flow. Permanent, if possible. So this is Jess, uh, Jessica Barter, who also came to CERN with us. And um, we just asked her to kind of read these texts and then built the piece from just how she'd spoken them. And she was getting a click track, which is why she has that uh, little headphone in her ear. Then we also made um, an avatar version of Jess, so a kind of CGI version just done on cheap, well, free, in fact, really cheap software. And um, the avatar is speaking um, something like an incantation. So I basically wrote this 300 line kind of text using um, autocomplete on my phone. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, like predictive text. And then I just picked through these kind of, most of it was like just rubbish. And then I just picked about kind of 30 sentences that I liked and structured them so they had this form of a kind of um, magical incantation. But because it's being done by my phone, it keeps just going off and going on about email and stuff, which is kind of quite funny. So I'll show you a bit of this. Reject the future of our tools. Speak the future of our games and apps and other details. Vision of what I can do for me to send you. Excavate the same for you to see you. Wreck it temporarily to form a message from your system. Examine the effect of the way it is the system. Reboot the router and switch to get the chance to win. Approach it weekly to get the chance to win. Verify your age and gender and development. Conduct a thorough and complete transmission of a new one. Allow to simmer for about a million times a year. Enlighten me via a call at your house, then I will send you. So, so I'm really into this thing. I've got quite into this idea that um, even, uh, you know, we humans are all striving for happiness and spiritual contentment and all this kind of stuff. 
I've got into this idea lately, and I'm sure I'm not the first person to think this, that everything, inanimate matter, is also in its own way kind of struggling for some sort of transcendence. And I like the fact that these are kind of just stupid algorithms. You know, Google Translate, predictive text, this software that made this. And yet, given a, the right pushes, it can kind of produce this sort of quasi-mystical kind of material. Uh, so there's two more texts, and then I'll, sh I'll just show you the final, what it all ends up being like. So one text that appears on the screen in the piece is just another thing that I Google translated, uh, something I'd written that I Google translated. Then the final piece, um, the final text, I mean, if you know uh, the Tao Te Ching, which is the sort of Chinese kind of two and a half thousand year old uh, book of Taoism, uh, the first two chapters of that are all about the relationship between language and reality. And there's this app that Google make, which is a sort of um, dictation app. So you speak into it and it transcribes, uh, it, so it turns into text what you said. And I just read the Tao Te Ching at it really quick. So it just couldn't keep up. And it, again, just produced all this amazing kind of gibberish. So I'll show you, uh, this is what the, this is the kind of format of the work. So it's a circle of eight speakers. Um, there's an octagon up there with LED strips. And every time an electrical signal goes to the LEDs, you also hear it as um, electrical noise through one of the speakers, which is something that Haroon, um, my collaborator, uses uh, a lot in his practice. Um, so lastly, I'll just show you a little bit of what it kind of ended up being like in, in the space. <coughs> Ooh, sorry. So that is how me and Haroon Mirza found the cutting edge of physics and then fell off it. Thank you. Evans F3 Goubet, Speedy, Gisor Bayekri, version 
Le peuple même, je suis la candidate providentielle. Y a pas meilleur que moi pour le poste présidentiel. Je suis jeune et ambitieuse, j'ai des idées nouvelles. J'imposerai une vraie conscience citoyenne. Mais le chemin du palais, je sais, est parsemé d'embûches. Et la conquête du pouvoir rime souvent avec triche. On m'a dit que dans ce domaine, je ne pourrais pas trouver mieux que vous pour réaliser le plus cher de mes voeux. <rire> Je suis le génie de la lampe digitale aux formules algorithmiques Magique phénoménale, détenteur de la technologie infaillible et imparable J'alimente la démocratie de façon pérenne et durable Pour les urnes, non, hors de question Encore moins la chaque conscience ou liquider l'opposition Pas de violence ni de menace, surtout pas d'intimidation Oubliez tout ça, c'est moi la solution Sur tout le monde, ce qu'il cache, ce qu'il montre, les secrets les plus intimes des innocents et des monstres. Pourquoi se limiter au corps quand on peut lire dans les esprits Les gens se confient, se confessent et déballent toute leur vie. Sur les réseaux sociaux, leurs tout nouveaux confidents. Alerte si inoffensif, compréhensif et intelligent. Vraie mine d'or de données personnelles et de renseignements. Ah, et sur quoi portent réellement ces renseignements <rire> Sur ce qu'ils mangent, ce qu'ils boivent, leurs rêves, leurs cauchemars, leurs couleurs préférées, leurs croyances, leurs espoirs. Ah, je suis rassuré, alors parlons dans mon programme. Non, c'est sur les émotions qu'on va baser votre campagne. Et pour rendre ce marketing politique possible, tout d'abord on profile, on classifie et puis on cible grâce à nos algorithmes qui calculent et déterminent les tendances et les intentions de vote qui se décident. I feel I have not a painting. 
I feel I'm be one and I have no 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 be dash One of the many beginnings of the beginnings, one of the many starts to the start, uh, was that sort of fortuitous moment when my father brought back the um, the night vision uh, lens to to see out of. He was leading the team of engineers and scientists who would be working on this um, this project. Um, we were in the military and therefore near the Department of Defense. He brought me home this little present. It, well, he wasn't giving it to me. He was giving me the experience, not the, not the actual night vision. And he said, come upstairs. I want to show you what can happen with this. And that's when the green came and the, it flooded in. How thrilling it was, how utterly thrilling it was and you could almost smell and hear the crickets and the dung and the outside that it was so pungent the green and the and what i saw it was really striking and it, i still think about it he was so excited to say that he was trying to bring light into the darkness and i being a grumpy child I said, well, maybe, but are you not also bringing death? Because isn't this a military weapon? The last little bit of the sopra. Where are our opera singers? They have gone home for the evening. Do the opera singer, Kurt Weil Graud, want to do one last one last moment. No. <laughs> okay, then drinks for all, and thank you for listening and being part of our entanglement. <laughs> <laughs>